So a couple times in this course, uh, we'll do a little bonus track uh, video to pick up on some of the themes that we've talked about in the main lecture, uh, but to go into more detail so that if you're a little fuzzy on things, you'll we have a few more examples in these. Um, also, just because usually there are some particular cases that are kind of fun to look at and hopefully a little bit instructive. So think of this as a bonus track uh, to lecture one. We'll do a couple of examples, finding beam equilibrium for point load, one using distributed load, and we'll throw in a twist that I think will explain a little bit or illustrate uh, a little bit uh, how the, the math actually kind of lays out when we're doing these. So in these, just for fun, we'll switch from simply supported beams to simply supported cantilever beams. A uh, cantilever beam is just uh, any beam that extends out beyond one of its, one or both of its uh, supports. So we'll take some of the same dimensions that we had last time. We were looking at a 32 foot beam with a 500 pound uh, load and, and sometimes a distributed load. And we'll look at a similar beam so that you can go back and compare the numbers uh, a little bit if you want. Um, but we'll stretch it out. So instead of a 32 foot simple span, that 32 feet will be supplemented by a 16 foot cantilever on the right hand end of the beam. And just for kicks, we'll throw in for this first one, another 500 pound load. We'll put that way out at the end uh, and we'll see what it does. So a 500 pound load at the, the mid span of the simply supported portion and a 500 pound load uh, way out here at the end. Um, if you think about it, this is what we call a springboard or a diving board. Um, a, a diving board is a really, really basic example of a beam that is both cantilevered uh, and simply supported. And we'll watch what happens here. We'll do the math. You may be able to see this one coming. There's sort of a surprise ending to this, and that'll help explain maybe how some of these equilibrium formulas work. So in every case, we're going to start by trying to find rotational equilibrium uh, around one of the supports. And Tradition has it, we'll start with moment around the, the right support here. So notice that we're going to have three forces that will have a moment around that support. RL, which we don't know yet, we don't know the magnitude, but we know that it will have a magnitude of 16, or a, a moment arm, sorry, of 16 feet plus 16 feet, so 32 feet. We have a 500 pound load here. It will have a moment arm of 16 feet around RR. And we have a 500 pound load here that'll have a moment arm also of 16 feet. And again, maybe you can see what's coming. So if we add all this together, we have RL times 32. That's going in the clockwise direction. That can be positive or negative, so long as we keep track of it. With me, I always think of clockwise as positive. So RL times 32 going clockwise. 500 pounds in the negative direction, right? This has a, a, is gonna impart a counterclockwise rotation around RR. So RL times 32 minus 500 pounds times 16 feet. And then we have this load over here at the end of the cantilever. And that too is gonna be 500 pounds and 16 feet, but look what it's doing. Right? That 500 pound load is actually imparting a moment in the same direction as RL. RL is imparting a clockwise uh, torque or moment. That 500 pound load is also imparting a clockwise moment. They're on opposite sides, but they're also going in opposite directions. So the net result is that we have two clockwise moments and one anti-clockwise moment, counterclockwise moment. Now, you can see what's going on here, right? We have two equal and opposite moments being imparted by those two forces. When we do the math, what we end up with is RL times 32 equals 500 pounds times 16 feet minus 500 pounds times 16 feet. We can certainly multiply that out if you want, but that's gonna end up being zero. 8,000 foot-pounds minus 8,000 foot-pounds is gonna be zero. RL times 32 is gonna be zero, and RL, therefore, is gonna to have to be zero. Okay, look at the beam again, right? What we have, it may, be, it may look like a simply supported beam with a cantilever, but basically, we've designed a perfectly balanced teeter-totter or seesaw. We have equal loads, and they are equally spaced around a fulcrum, whatever's going on here doesn't actually really matter. So we're going to say that RL uh, actually 
disappears is zero. Now, if you think this through, the weight of the beam is going to figure into this at some point. But for our purposes, we'll keep things pure. We're just looking at external load. We're not looking at the dead load of the beam just yet. And therefore, RL is zero, right? All we have uh, to, to work with is, all we need to work with is RR. So we can still go back and sum things for the, um, uh, the uh, equilibrium in the vertical direction, sum of y equals zero. And here we see that we have 500 pounds and 500 pounds, and they're both going down. They're both pushing the beam down. So both of those are negative, minus 500, minus 500. Our R is going in the opposite direction. It's going up, positive. Collectively, that all has to equal zero. And RR, not surprisingly, is going to be equal and opposite to the sum total of those two, but going in the opposite direction. That all checks out, right? RL has to be equal zero to keep the thing in equilibrium around that. So we have those two forces that have to be uh, countered by the reaction RR. RR is really going to be the only thing we have to, to stabilize the, the beam uh, in, uh, in the vertical direction. So RR will equal 1,000 pounds. RL will equal zero. Okay, what happens if we take that one 500 pound load away? We saw that when we had two of them equally spaced around one fulcrum or one support, that this one became trivial, right? So now what happens if we take that load off? Well, we do the same thing. We're gonna solve for rotational equilibrium around the right reaction again. Some of them are equal zero. We'll go through and we'll look at all of the potential forces that might have a moment around that point. So RL certainly will. It has a 32-foot moment arm. We don't know its magnitude yet. And now note that the only other load that we have is the external load that we're putting on the end of the cantilever, the 500 pounds. So the magnitude is 500 pounds, and the moment arm around the right reaction is 16 feet. So RL times 32 plus 8,000 foot-pounds, 500 pounds times 16 equals zero. Again, maybe you can see what's coming. We'll take the 8,000 foot-pounds, we'll move it to the other side of the equation. Note that it has to go from a positive to a negative. We're gonna subtract 8,000 foot-pounds from both sides, so the number over here is gonna be negative. We can divide both sides now by 32 feet to get a figure in pounds. And 8,000 divided by 32 is 250 pounds. Notice, though, because this is minus 8,000 foot-pounds, RL equals minus 250 pounds. So the assumption that we made that RL would be positive is actually wrong. What that negative sign tells us is that if we've assumed that RL is going in one direction, we have to flip it around. And in fact, RL is going to be pulling down with a force of 250 pounds. This seems pretty exotic, right? This is gonna be what we call a tension foundation. Instead of supporting the beam, lifting it up, RL is actually going to have to hold the beam down. And if you think about it, this is exactly right. We have a 500 pound force on the end of a very long lever here as that pushes down, that fulcrum is going to tend to make the other side of the beam pull up. And if you've ever jumped on the end of a diving board or a springboard, you know exactly this, that that joint at the back of the diving board actually literally has to hold the back end of the diving board down when you're out at the, out at the end of it. So, okay, our L is now pulling down with a force of 250 pounds. What is that going to do to the, to the right reaction, the right-hand reaction? We'll go ahead and we'll solve for sum of forces in the y direction equals zero, translational equilibrium. We don't want our springboard to rotate, but we also, of course, don't want it to move up or down. And now we'll sum up everything we know about the forces acting on the beam in the vertical direction. Well, this gets kind of interesting. We have RL, which is pulling the beam down at 250 pounds. We have a force at the end of the beam, and a force at the end of the cantilever that's pushing down again, 500 pounds. And the only vertical force we have to resist that is RR, which very clearly is going to have to do a lot of work pushing in the up direction. So we sum those up, 750 pounds plus RR equals zero. We can pull the 750 pounds over to the other side. And what we find is that the right reaction 
is 750 pounds pushing up just like we'd expect. But look at what's happened. Because of the position of that load way out at the end of the cantilever and the uplift that that causes at the back of the beam, this reaction is actually going to be greater than the load that we're putting on the beam itself. And if you look at this, if we sum it up, 500 plus 250 minus 750, that all checks out. If you want to check for the reaction around, uh, uh, for the moments around reaction left, we can do that, right? All of these times their moment arm now around the other support ought to equal zero as well. So the 250 pounds has no moment arm. Uh, we don't have to, uh, we, we, we won't get any moment out of that. So RL times zero, RL times its moment arm around that, which obviously is zero. Reaction right, 750 pounds, that has a 32 foot moment arm around the left support. So 750 times 32. And then the 500 pound load at the end of the cantilever, that has a moment arm of 48 feet around the left support. And notice again, we're being careful about the signs. The 750 pounds is going to impart now a counterclockwise rotation around the left support. So we're giving it a negative sign. The 500 pounds is going to induce a clockwise reaction around the left support. So we're giving it a, a positive. We hope that all of this equals zero. 750 times 32 is 24,000. We're multiplying feet and pounds. So we get 24,000 foot pounds, negative. 500 pounds times 48 feet. We also get 24,000 foot pounds and notice that it's in the opposite direction. So these two check out. The moment that this imparts around that point is equal and opposite to the moment that this imparts around that point. Everything's hunky-dory, right? 24,000 foot pounds equals 24,000 foot pounds. The springboard, as weird as it seems, with a reaction that's greater than the load we're putting on it, um, it is all in equilibrium. Rotational equilibrium about the right support, rotational equilibrium around the left support, translational equilibrium in the Y direction, no force is happening in the, in the horizontal direction. Okay, let's do one last uh, bonus example here. And again, we'll take our springboard beam, uh, but instead of a point load, we'll put a distributed load onto it. And the distributed load will be 200 pounds per linear foot. And it'll extend along the entire 48 foot uh, length of the beam. So the first thing we have to do to find the reactions is to determine an equivalent point load for that distributed load. So what is that equal to and where does it occur? We take the magnitude of the distributed load, 200 pounds per linear foot. We multiply it by the number of linear feet that we have, the length of the, of the load, no, not necessarily the length of the span, and 200 pounds per linear foot times 48 feet. Note that the feet cancel out and we're left with a figure in pounds, 9,600 pounds. It is the total magnitude of all of that distributed load piled up into one, uh, one number. Now, the position will be at the half point of the load, not the half point of the beam, and certainly not the half point of the span. In this case, the half point of the load and the beam coincide, but note that it's not going to happen in the middle of the span. It's going to happen in the middle of the, of the load there. So that is going to be 24 feet from either end. It'll be half of the total length of the load that, that we're putting on the beam. So we can take away the arrows for the distributed load. We can replace that with a single arrow, an equivalent point load, not an actual point load. This will be important next week, uh, but, but a point load that's equivalent in magnitude. And, and by, put it, by figuring out the position, we now also have enough to tell us how to keep the beam in rotational equilibrium. So again, we will solve for rotational equilibrium around the right support. Sum of moments around R equals zero. And if we go in and look, we have basically just two forces that can impart a moment around reaction right. And that is the left-hand reaction. Its moment arm is going to be 32 feet. That's the, the lever arm that it has around the right reaction. And then we also have the, the 9,600 pound equivalent point load. Now, its moment arm we have to think about a little bit. 
Uh, right reaction is located 32 feet from the left-hand edge. The load is located 24 feet, half of the total span. So its moment arm, that load's moment arm is gonna be this distance here, which is going to be 32 feet minus 24 feet, or eight feet. So RL times 32, still don't know RL, but we know now that 9,600 pounds times eight feet will be the moment imparted by the equivalent point load. Notice that the moment associated with RL is positive. It's going clockwise around the right support. The moment associated with the 9,600 pound is negative. It's going counterclockwise. So we can move the 9,600 pounds times eight to the other side. 9,600 pounds times eight feet is gonna be 76,800, notice, foot pounds. And if we take RL's moment arm out of that, we'll end up with a magnitude for the force in RL that's required to balance the moment of the 9,600 pound equivalent point load. So divide both sides by 32 feet, 76,800 foot pounds divided by 32 feet, the feet cancel out, RL is going to equal 2,400 pounds. And now we can solve for translational equilibrium in the vertical direction, right? We want the sum of forces in the y direction to be zero. We have a very, very simple equation here. We have 2,400 pounds pushing up in the left reaction. We have 9,600 pounds pushing down uh, at the equivalent point load. So 2,400 pounds positive up minus 9,600 pounds, negative down. And the difference between those is going to have to be taken up by the right-hand reaction. If we do the math, we get minus 7,200 pounds plus RR equals zero, or RR equals 7,200 pounds. So we've now found a way to keep that uh, evenly loaded, distributed uh, load uh, balanced on the beam. We have two reactions that are quite different. You'll notice that one is almost three times uh, the other one, and that has to do with that cantilever and how that kind of pulls the centroid of that distributed load closer and closer to it. Remember, the closer a load gets to a reaction, the more that reaction is gonna have to carry uh, to balance out the, the load in the simply supported beam. Okay, with those bonus examples uh, done, we will move on next week to going from thinking about the uh, equilibrium from external loads and supports. We'll actually dive in and we'll start to do some thought experiments to try to figure out what happens within the beam itself. We'll do this by first finding the reactions. That's always gonna be the first step. But then we'll try to think about what those reactions are doing to the fabric of the beam, right? The cross section of the beam. And we'll do some thinking, we'll kind of put our x-ray vision specs on and try to imagine how internal stresses in the beam can counteract the external forces that we're putting onto it. It'll be a little bit of heavy going. There'll be, uh, there'll be uh, some math to do. There'll be some procedures to do uh, and, and a little bit of not really calculus, but thinking toward calculus, slopes and things like that. It'll be worth it though, because at the end of next week, we'll come up with shear moment diagrams for loading conditions. And these, if you look at some of them, are actual kind of architectural shapes, right? These shapes are derived from real structural conditions, the mathematics that it takes to not just keep beams in equilibrium uh, externally, but to keep every fiber of the beam in equilibrium uh, internally as well.